Secretary Grantchat. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's Downing Street press conference. I'm pleased to be joined today by Professor Stephen Powers, National Medical Director of NHS England, and again by Sir Peter Hendy, Chair of Network Rail and directing the restart of transport system. Let me begin uh, by updating you on the latest information from the government's COBRA file. On the first slide here, uh, we can see the latest information on infections. Results from the ONS Infection Survey, published this morning, estimate that the number of people who have tested positive for coronavirus in England fell from 152,000 between the 27th of April and the 10th of May to 33,000 between the 25th of May and the 7th of June. This is encouraging progress and suggests that around one in 1,700 people in the community had coronavirus during the latest period of the survey. SAGE has also confirmed today that their estimate of the R rate for the UK is unchanged on last week at 0.7 to 0.9. We want to keep the R rate number below one, and R, of course, is the average number of additional people infected by each infected person. The second slide shows the confirmed cases with the test. 6,434,713 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out or posted out in the UK. This includes 193,253 tests carry out, carried out or posted out yesterday. 292,950 people have tested positive, an increase of 1,541 cases since yesterday. The graph shows a steadily falling number of identified cases on a seven-day rolling average, despite the increase in testing. The third slide shows the latest data from hospitals. 535 people were admitted to hospital with coronavirus in England, Wales and Northern Ireland on the 9th of June, down from 722 a week earlier and down from a peak of 3,432 on the 1st of April. 392 coronavirus patients are currently in mechanical ventilation beds in the UK, down from 571 a week ago and down from a peak of 3,301 on the 12th of April. The fourth slide shows what is happening in hospitals across the country. There are now 5,607 people in hospital with coronavirus in the UK, down 20% from 7,036 a week ago, and down from a peak of 20,697 on the 12th of April. As the graphs show, while there is some variation, most nations and regions in the UK are broadly following a similar pattern. The fifth slide shows the daily figures for those who've sadly lost their lives after testing positive for coronavirus. Across all settings, the total number of deaths now stands at 41,481. That's an increase of 202 fatalities since yesterday. When measured by a seven-day rolling average, the daily number of deaths currently stands at 174, down from a peak of 943 on the 14th of April. Although the number of deaths is now firmly down, our deepest sympathies go out to all those who've lost loved ones. Transport is instrumental to our recovery, to connect people with jobs, to help level up Britain, and even to make us a healthier and more active nation. But as people start to travel, transport also presents one of our biggest challenges. How we protect passengers, prevent the spread of virus, even as we become more mobile. Transport use may be the first occasion since the onset of COVID that we've shared confined spaces with others. So it's critical, cr critical that we all take a vigilant and cautious approach over the next few weeks. I'm just going to say this. If you can work from home, you should continue to do so. If you cannot work from home, you should try to avoid public transport. 
If you must use public transport, you should travel at quieter times of day. And if you are an employer, you should do everything in your power to prevent staff from travelling unless it's absolutely vital. And please do allow staff to travel at quieter times. Now, from Monday, it becomes mandatory in England to wear a face covering on public transport. That includes trains, buses, trams, ferries and planes. A face covering does not mean a surgical mask. Face coverings can be made at home and you can find guidance to do so on gov.uk. As we move to recovery, it's more important than ever to protect each other, preventing those showing no symptoms from infecting others. I know there's huge public support for compulsory face coverings. They show respect for our fellow travellers. But for clarity, transport operators will be able to refuse permission to travel where someone isn't using a face covering. And this weekend, I'm taking powers through the Public Health Act, leading to fines for non-compliance too. We'll take a gentle approach to enforcement during the first couple of days. And help will be at hand. In addition to the British Transport Police, the uh, staff from Network Rail, from TfL, Transport for London, and transport operators. In the coming weeks, we'll also deploy journey makers to assist and remind commuters of the need to wear face coverings. Plus, the Safer Transport campaign will provide plenty of reminders at bus stops and rail stations and on social media. Remembering your face covering should be uh, the same as picking up your phone, your wallet, or your purse whenever you're leaving the house. Please read the guidance, ensure you have a face covering, and protect your fellow commuters. This crisis has tested our nation, yet through adversity comes possibility. A greener transport future within our grasp. For example, through the £2 billion investment in uh, the cycling and walking programme. The challenge, though, is to make transport currently our biggest emitter of greenhouse gases, part of the solution, not of the problem. If you take the aviation sector, for example, which has had an impossible few months, yet despite these obvious challenges, there's a real determination within the industry to have a greener restart. So we're bringing together leaders from aviation, environmental groups and government to form the Jet Zero Council. This group will be charged with making net zero emissions possible for future flights. Our goal within a generation will be to demonstrate flight across the Atlantic without harming the environment. And today, we're backing a company called Velocis, who are building a plant for aviation biofuels in Lincolnshire. I'm also excited about a Cambridge University and Whittle Labs project to accelerate te technologies for zero carbon flight. The shared experience of fighting coronavirus has changed us in many different ways. It's, uh, although it's forced us apart, it's also brought us together. Although it's tested us, it's also shown us at our very best. And although it's made us reflect on the past, it's focused us on those plans for the future. But now, as we become more mobile, we must not forget this insidious virus is still a threat. That, own, that not only means avoiding public transport if you can, it also means, from Monday, wearing a face covering on public transport, avoiding gatherings of more than six people, including to protest. I understand that people want to show their passion for issues that they care deeply about. And we must never be complacent about stamping out racism and discrimination in this country. But please, for the sake of your health and that of your friends and families, don't attend mass gatherings. We've come a long way. As we move towards recovery, let's protect lives as well as livelihoods. Thank you very much. I, I'm going to turn to David from Sunderland, member of the public, who has uh, the first question, and these are questions. Thank you for taking this question. It's likely that some businesses will not survive this pandemic. 
and therefore unemployment will rise. What specific plans do the government have to create jobs? Thank you. David, thank you very much for um, that question. And you're absolutely right. We've seen the scale of the challenge. We've seen the new um, statistics out today. And we recognize that in common with the rest of the world, we have an enormous uh, battle on our hands, not only with the uh, coronavirus and um, the recovery from that, but also with recovering the economy. And of course, during this uh, entire pandemic, what we've tried to do is to sort of put our arms around um, the British people to make sure that we have those schemes, including the furlough scheme, uh, the business loans, uh, grants to hospitality industry, and very much uh, more besides, to try to ensure that jobs can be protected against what we uh, hope uh, will be a, a temporary, uh, but albeit very severe, uh, we understand, a jolt to the economy. So in terms of your question, David, we absolutely want to make sure uh, that, first of all, jobs aren't lost where uh, the businesses are just experiencing downturns because they've been closed these last few weeks and uh, months. Uh, and secondly, to have a really proactive stance towards uh, getting this economy uh, going again when it is safe to do so. And it absolutely has to be stressed that the safety is the most important part of this. People have not given up weeks and months at home, uh, sacrificed so much uh, in order for us to throw that away uh, with a second spike. Um, but yeah, we will absolutely be coming forward uh, with plans, making sure that we're protecting uh, jobs as we've been doing throughout this uh, and making sure that people can get back into uh, employment. Uh, Simon from Dorset uh, has the next question, which I think is a written question. He says, we hear a lot about uh, antibody testing, which will tell us if we have been exposed to the virus. Uh, what work is being done to establish if antibodies mean less risk of infection or possible immunity? And I think I can probably do no better than this to turn to the professor. Steve. Thank you, thank you, Secretary of State. Well, thank you, Simon, for the question. A lot of work is being done on the question of whether the development of antibodies after an infection uh, is a marker of immunity. So after any infection, particularly virus infections, the body will generate these antibodies that uh, act to uh, ensure that the virus is controlled in the first infection, but mo more importantly, in any subsequent exposure to the virus, ensure that either the virus doesn't take hold uh, in the individual or, or perhaps that the disease is a lot milder the second time round. I should say that antibodies are not the only way that the body's immune system works. There are other mechanisms for uh, combating viruses, and there's a whole host of science around cellular immunity, so how cells respond, not just antibodies, which are proteins. But the important question here is we can measure antibodies. Indeed, we are now measuring antibodies, so we are beginning to, get, beginning, beginning to get a sense of how many people have developed antibodies in response to the virus. And a very key question is, does, does that antibody response, does that positive test mean that there is immunity in the future? So it will only be time and studies over time that really tell us the answer to that question, but those studies are underway. For example, in the health service in the NHS, uh, Public Health England have launched a study called SIREN, and SIREN is recruiting healthcare staff uh, who may have been exposed to the virus into a study that will follow them over time to see, firstly, if they develop the virus again by the swab testing, and secondly, how that correlates, how that is associated with antibody levels and the positive antibody test that they may have been developed. And we have been encouraging as many staff as possible throughout our NHS organisations to join that study. So, short answer, we will only know in time, but we are certainly working on that here in the UK, and it is also being worked on internationally. Stephen, thanks very much, and Simon, thank you for your question. Uh, I'll turn now to Catherine Burns from the BBC. Catherine. Hi, this question is for you and Professor Powers, please. Twice as many people have died from coronavirus across the poorest parts of England and Wales compared to wealthier parts of the country. How can it be that where you live can double your chances of dying? Doesn't this show that more needs to be done to deal with health inequalities? Um, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll have a go at that, Catherine. Yes, I agree, but more always needs to be done uh, to deal with health inequalities, and it's something we're very passionate about. And we were elected on the basis of sort of levelling up, by which we mean getting rid of the health uh, inequalities, getting rid of the ability for people to have opportunities. The first question about jobs and access to jobs and productivity within different regions. I'm a Northern Powerhouse 
uh, minister. And part of my job is to make sure that the north, where people work every bit as hard, should have the same productivity, which is partly down to things like transport, housing, and many other things which lead into health uh, inequalities as well. So, um, yes, I'm, I think we're all convinced these things are all linked together. Uh, we're absolutely dedicated um, to uh, tackling them, um, but for a, possibly a more scientific answer, uh, I'll turn to Sim. Yes, we absolutely should be focusing on health inequalities more, and that's exactly what the NHS is doing. It's exactly what was in the long-term plan that NHS England published at the start of last year. It's the case that many of the risk factors that underlie COVID-19, so those things that mean you are more likely to do badly when you get the infection, like diabetes, like obesity, like heart and lung disease, we see more frequently uh, in more deprived areas of the country. Uh, and so tackling those issues uh, fundamentally will also mean that uh, people are less likely uh, for uh, infections such as COVID-19. So we have very targeted approaches. I lead the cardiovascular programs at NHS England, and we've been putting in place very targeted approaches in, in heart disease, for, for example, that really focus on the most deprived areas, uh, because it is absolutely crucial that we narrow the gap in health inequalities. Thank you. If I can just ask a quick follow-up question also to you and Professor Powers. There are reports that the Chief Nursing Officer, Ruth May, is either unwilling or unable to attend these press conferences anymore because she won't defend Dominic Cummings. Can you please tell me if this is true? And if so, do you think that is right? Uh, well, I'll, I, I don't think it is true. Um, she's um, uh, attended them many times um, before. I, I noticed actually that uh, at the top of the number 10 Twitter feed, um, I see one of her uh, tweets um, pinned, uh, and uh, and so I'm absolutely sure she's been a regular contributor before, and I'm sure she'll be back here uh, again. Uh, oh, I, I don't know anything about the, the various discussions, but all I can say is that I've been here many times saying exactly what I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you, um, Catherine, for your question. I turn to uh, Tom Clark at ITV. Um, hello, uh, Secretary of State. Uh, thanks very much for taking my question. Uh, the First one, I think it's for you. Uh, my second question, if I may, for Professor Powers. Given the economic uh, figures that came out today, which I think can only be described as dismal, wouldn't it be sensible to mandate the wearing of masks everywhere, not just on public transport? In fact, to do any measure that might help get the economy back on its feet that would help prevent the further spread of the virus. And to you, Professor Paris, um, the R number across the UK is still stubbornly uh, near to one. According to the scientific advice, that's largely because the amount of coronavirus in hospitals and care homes. I noticed looking at the most recent Public Health England data for respiratory outbreaks in hospitals, we've had the largest increase in respiratory outbreaks since the peak in the last week. Does that show that whatever we're doing in hospitals to prevent coronavirus spreading is not working. Thanks very much, Tom. Uh, so look, on the first point about, I should say, face coverings for public transport, not face masks, really important. Um, uh, I know that um, Peter's been working on this uh, the last few weeks, and we're very, very keen. I'll ask him to say a word about that in, in, in a second. Um, my understanding of the science, and I know that Stephen will put me right if I, if I get this wrong, that in terms of sort of priority, Social distancing is absolutely the most important thing, along with washing your hands and along with not touching your face. So perhaps those things are equal, Stephen will tell us. Um, we found when we um, looked at the evidence on, on face coverings um, that it was um, distant to those things. In the end, as you know, and as I mentioned in my comments before, um, we've decided to bring those in and make them mandatory because it is something that actually helps your fellow commuter, your fellow traveller, and we thought that that was a, a good thing to do um, for society. By its very nature, if you are on a train or a plane or a ferry or a bus, you're in an enclosed uh, area. Uh, that's not the case if you are out and about on the streets, and I think that may be the principal um, difference uh, of this. I wonder if I can just um, use your point to ask Sir Peter to comment on um, the face masks coming in and the work that's going on there, and then I'll go to Stephen on your last point. So thank you, Secretary of State. On, on face coverings, when we first uh, uh, were restarting uh, the transport system, when people were um, uh, first uh, able to uh, travel again, apart from essential workers, uh, the government said then 
that um, uh, face coverings were recommended when it might be uh, likely that you would be close to other, other people. The reality of our transport systems, and particularly as the economy ramps up, is that there'll be more and more occasions at which you might be uh, closer to people than you would care for. So it seems perfectly logical to me and all my colleagues as transport operators to mandate face coverings now, because as we get to Monday and the uh, restart of uh, non-essential retail and looking at more people going to work, it's much more likely that you'll see uh, or be close to other people. So face coverings is a, a sensible uh, thing to do and uh, we're expecting on Monday because passengers are hugely sensible for people to be wearing face coverings. My understanding, thanks Peter, my understanding, you know, it's an enclosed space and I think that's the, the key difference between that and walking down the street. But I'm just going to let's go to the expert both on that and the R number question, Stephen. So, so on the face mask, uh, as I think the Chief Medical Officer and Chief Scientific Advisor have said a number of times on this podium, the evidence is, is weak, uh, but nevertheless there is uh, some evidence uh, and it is, it is better for enclosed spaces than open spaces where there is less risk of transmission. On the question of hospitals uh, and infection in hospitals, you're absolutely right. It is very important uh, that we focus very hard on infection in hospitals. Clearly the hospital environment is one where uh, there is more infection because we, are tr we have been treating many, many thousands of patients with infection and clearly infection control and stopping any potential spread in those environments is critical. This is something that the NHS and hospitals are well used to. We've been managing infection control for many, many years. We've had great success in things like MRSA. If you go back 15 years ago, that was common to see people infected with MRSA in the blood in hospitals and through rigorous infection control that's uh, that is very much all you know the levels are much much lower almost eliminated so we know how to do this so as we've learned more about this virus and how it spreads for instance the potential for asymptomatic individuals to spread we've been working closer and closer with our hospitals and other healthcare settings to ensure that we have the policies the processes in place to ensure that uh, we minimise the risk of spread. So, so if I give you some of the examples of, of what's been put in place, so we have been increasing the amount of testing that we've been doing both of staff and patients. So quite a while ago now, we started testing all patients who were being admitted as emergencies into hospitals, not just those with symptoms uh, of COVID that would allow us to spot those people who were asymptomatic and make sure that they were uh, cohorted uh, or segregated appropriately from other patients. We started testing staff who were obviously symptomatic, uh, and then we started testing staff who were asymptomatic. More recently, we have had a real focus on data collection and understanding those organisations where we need, who we need to support the most. And Ruth May, the Chief Nursing Officer, is leading on that work. Uh, and only today, after the Secretary of State's announcement last week, uh, we have asked all uh, hospitals and healthcare settings to introduce the routine fairing, uh, wearing of surgical masks. And the reason for that is when you move out of the ward areas where PPE is worn into the corridors and spaces where sometimes it it's, can be harder to ma manage social distancing, it's important that the use of face masks is, is there to further reduce the, the chance of transmission. So we have progressively, uh, over the course of this epidemic, introduced more and more measures as we've learned more about this virus to really minimise the risk of uh, transmission in hospital. But you're absolutely right, it's, it's something we have to con continue our focus on uh, and, and ensure we control. Tom, you want to come in very briefly? Just, just, just quickly then, why do you think you've seen an increase in outbreaks in hospitals in the last week? So, so I think as we are moving uh, now from a small, from a, a community uh, incidence, so community uh, amount of infection that is reducing, what we will begin to see uh, over time is more focus on individual uh, outbreaks. And, uh, and of course, that might not just be hospitals, there might be other settings. Uh, you will know from international reports that abattoirs and meat processing uh, factories have been subject to outbreaks, possibly because in a cold environment, a very cold environment, the virus is more stable. So I think we are now moving from a period of time where we've had to focus on a high level, of that surge of infection in the population, through to managing more discrete outbreaks, which, as again you have heard at this podium, will mean more local interventions uh, to manage that. And again, that is something that, that 
Public Health England, the local directors of public health and local government, and the NHS is used to dealing with. In non-epidemic circumstances, from time to time, we do see outbreaks of infectious diseases, and we know how to manage them. Tom, thank you very much. I think it's just worth mentioning and reminding people, um, Stephen, that from Monday, people should take face coverings to hospital yes. if they're going there for any That's reason as well. at all. Um, thank you. Let's turn now to Ashish Joshi from Sky. Ashish. Thank you very much. My first question is to you, Mr. Shapps. You were talking about the importance of the R rate. For the first time today, we've had a regional breakdown. So while nationally, we're still at one or just below. In the southwest, we've got a range of between 0.8 to 1.1, which takes us above that all-important number the Prime Minister has talked about so many times. Are we moving now towards the very real possibility of regional lockdowns? Thank you. Um, so my understanding, again, it'd be wise for me to turn to medical expertise, but on the um, R rate and the way that's being published today, um, the range, uh, as you mentioned, is 0.7 to 0.9. Uh, nationwide and we're confident that uh, from what we understand from SAGE that it's therefore less than one. Um, there's then a band uh, in each area, across the country, but in each area, uh, where uh, there's a sort of high and a low estimate uh, made uh, based on a number of series of different modelling uh, approaches um, taken by uh, SAGE and it so happens that one of them, as you rightly say, um, says it could be between 0.9 and 1.1 but it's an outlier of the, I think, the central um, estimate. Um, to answer your question directly, um, we, we are very interested, of course, to be able the more data we can uh, analyse, the more we can see where there are outbreaks. Um, I noticed today we're at 193,000 plus um, tests done or, or sent out. So we're, we've got a large number of tests being um, produced, and that gives us much better, uh, more informative data about where issues might bubble uh, uh, up in the future. So, I, you know, I wouldn't want to rule anything out, uh, but I think probably that southwest figure today isn't quite as uh, maybe being reported. But again, I turn to the expertise of, of the professor. Well, yes, uh, thank you. And it's exactly as the Secretary of State uh, has described. So SAGE, or its modelling group, SPY-M, uh, takes data from a number of different academic groups who do modelling uh, around the R number. And then it takes all those individual models, which are all slightly different. They're all using slightly different assumptions and different models. And then it produces a consensus. Uh, and when it produces that consensus, it essentially has a central most likely projection and then a range around it, which, which represents that you can never be completely confident on a single central projection and there, there is a range, what we call a confidence limit, that you might be familiar with in statistics. Uh, and and uh, as, you are, as you said, SAGE for the first time uh, today has published those regional R values. They do have central projections and ranges. Uh, and the important thing is that in all regions, the central uh, projection within that range is below one. Thank you. Ashes, do you want to come back? Can I yes, just... I oh, sorry. Actually. Can, 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 I, can I just ask, we've been speaking to local businesses and people in the southwest region today. They're quite worried about it. So what would you say to them to allay their fears and concerns? So I actually cut Stephen off. You, you were finishing the point as well. Well, and probably well I, can I, I was going to make a further point uh, around that R, of course, is a very important uh, way of looking at this. But, but there are other uh, things that we look at. So you may also be aware that the Office for National Statistics has published again today uh, the results from their surveillance study where they randomly sample individuals in the population uh, to directly look for how many people are testing positive for this virus. Uh, and that study has shown that uh, over the last uh, month or so, the last few weeks, we have seen a steady reduction in their projection of the number of infections in the community. And, and really that evidence uh, also uh, suggests that the R value is below one because it's only when the R value is below one that we would see that decrease in the number of infections. So R is really important, but there are other ways too of measuring how, uh, vi how, uh, how frequent the virus is in the population. Uh, uh, yeah, and Ashes, I'd, I'd say, look, um, the message to somebody in the southwest watching um, this, concerned that they've seen that at least one of the projection models um, suggests there's a range which could go above one is please um, stay alert, follow the advice, um, stay at home. Um, that's the only, we, we now know, that's the only way to um, defeat this thing in the short term. Um, and it's doubly important to do so, but uh, across the country as well. Uh, and I think not to be over alarmed because, as uh, Professor Stephen 
Powers has said, um, this was actually the, outli the, the top of the range, which had a number of others, which showed it was still uh, below one. But please, stay alert. Can I turn to Natasha Clark at The Sun? Thanks very much. My first question is to you, Transport Secretary. Uh, several airlines have said that the government hasn't spoken to them in any detail about plans for air bridges, which would allow people to travel to countries with low rates of infection without having to quarantine. Is the government currently in talks with individual current countries for air bridges or travel corridors, which could make that travel easier? If so, how are those talks progressing and have any countries declined to work with us so far? And to Stephen Powers, uh, Chris Whitty said earlier this week there was a reasonable chance there will be a second wave of the virus this winter. What extra arrangements are the NHS and the government putting into place to prepare for this in our hospital and care homes and for the effect of a potential second lockdown, given how poorly prepared we were the first time? Natasha, thanks very much. I mean, I, as Transport Secretary, of course, I spend a, a lot of time speaking to uh, the whole of the aviation um, sector, amongst many others, and uh, including on um, issues to do with things like uh, uh, the quarantine, which is the basis of the uh, reason why air bridges would be interesting at all. And first of all, just on the, the quarantine, I mean, I think most, most, most Brits understand that we've sacrificed a lot. We've stayed at home. We've, you know, been fighting this virus, getting the R number below one. What we don't want to do is, you know, end up um, sort of essentially re-importing it, either by people coming here or Brits going abroad and coming back. So I think the idea of a quarantine um, is the right thing to be doing. And I, I note that it has uh, broad public support. But you're absolutely right. We've always said it would come in as a a blanket thing initially, and that's what happened, uh, and that we would look at uh, whether it would be safe to, for example, open up uh, what you call air bridges, might better be described um, as travel corridors, because of course you can get here by rail and by ferries as, as well. Uh, and, uh, and that's something that we're actively uh, working on. Um, the first review of this takes place on the 29th of June. So I'm sorry to disappoint you about which countries we're speaking to and all the, all the, all the rest of it. We will need to um, wait. At the moment, uh, it is a, a blanket um, situation. Um, but we're, of course, talking to uh, airlines who are part of the uh, specialist working groups um, on this and talking to uh, airports and, uh, indeed, we'll talk to uh, other countries uh, about it. But the basic principle should be uh, that we must make sure that we don't end up uh, in a second wave um, situation, which rather leads into your second question. People would expect us uh, not to do that and to take every precaution against it, and we will only open up air bridges where it is safe to do so, and there'll be uh, more on that at the review period, which is the 29th of June, and on the second point about the second wave. Yes, so um, hopefully we, we won't have that second wave, but of course we have to think about the possibility and prepare for it. I would take a bit of issue that the NHS was poorly prepared, because I think the NHS did an absolutely magnificent job, considering this was a virus that we didn't know about until January, uh, started coming to the UK in February and March, and then we saw, saw that huge surge in March and April. And the NHS, in my view, responded magnificently in very, very rapidly changing the way it worked in order to ensure that we had the capacity both in our general beds, but also in our ITU beds for the sickest patients, to ensure that at no time uh, was that capacity breached. And we always had the capacity in place for patients who needed it. And unfortunately, in other countries, in other settings, we saw that wasn't the case. So I think the NHS showed just how flexible it can be in a crisis. Now, it's clear that we have learned lessons from that. It's clearly that we, going forward, can take some of the learning from that uh, uh, in case we have a second phase. So, for instance, we uh, worked very flexibly. People, staff, worked flexibly in ways that they may not have done previously, and that will be possible again going forward. The Nightingale hospitals were built uh, in case we need them, and we're actively considering uh, what we need to do with those going uh, forward uh, to ensure that if there is a second wave, we have capacity in place. Uh, and we're also looking at uh, usage of beds. And for instance, in outpatients and other areas, much more video consultation so, uh, and much more remote consultation. So, so different ways of working, some of which we've wanted to do in the NHS, but we have done in an accelerated fashion. So we are thinking very hard about how we can get back to business, back to normal business in the NHS. That's really important, that we uh, are able to do all the stuff we do normally, but at the same time make sure that, although we are working hard to make sure it doesn't happen, that if we do see an increase in coronavirus and perhaps in the winter, that we have the capacity uh, in order to deal with that as well as uh, the, the normal business of the NHS. 
Thanks, Stephen. Um, Natasha, was there anything you wanted to come back on? Can I just follow up with um, the Transport Secretary? What do you think would be the best measure, in, in your view, to, to replace the quarantine system with, if indeed, uh, after this review, do you decide that a, a different uh, approach needs to be taken? Obviously, the, the Home Secretary's discussed testing airports, uh, and, and obviously you've mentioned air bridges just now. What do you personally think might be the, the best replacement for it? Well, as I've said before, and uh, the Prime Minister said and the Home Secretary said, um, air bridges or travel corridors are certainly a potential way forward, and that can be uh, supplemented by things like um, testing as well. Although, again, you have to take the scientific advice on the validity of, of doing things like testing uh, at ports, airports, and other places. Um, but there's, uh, you know, clearly uh, there are countries that have lower levels of infection, but that may be because they've yet to go into this rather than. Uh, that they've come out of it um, again. So we need to be very careful and cautious. We won't throw away the good work that's been done, but we'll have um, very sensible uh, conversations. Uh, and um, this would certainly be limited in the first place. And I'm speaking with the uh, airlines and aviation sector the whole time uh, about this. Indeed, we issued actually fresh guidance just yesterday uh, for, uh, for aviation and for passengers. Uh, so it's an active conversation, and there'll be more on this before very long. Thank you very much, Natasha. I'm going to turn to... Adam Payne from Business Insider. Adam. Good afternoon, Secretary of State, and thank you very much. I have a question about businesses that are dealing with the impact of COVID-19. We learned today that the government no longer plans full checks on goods coming from the EU in January. Isn't this announcement an admission that UK businesses focused on COVID-19 are not ready to trade with the EU without a deal at the start of the year, despite the government saying it is prepared to do so? And isn't it also the case that this new plan only covers goods coming into the UK, meaning businesses that are already suffering because of COVID-19 face the prospect of another big economic challenge in January. And a question for Professor Powis, please. Good afternoon, Professor. Uh, there have been reports recently of concern within the pharmaceutical industry that the combined strain of COVID-19 and leaving the EU without uh, sufficient trading arrangements could, play, could, could put the NHS in a position where it doesn't have enough medicine supplies. Is this a possibility? And if so, how concerned are you by it? Thanks very much, um, Adam. Uh, look, uh, without wanting to get back into the, the whole Brexit debate, and um, we have now left the EU at the beginning of the year. We leave the transition period at the end of the year. And it's this government's judgment that the best possible thing we can do for business is provide it with absolute certainty that we will not be stretching out or extending the transition period in any way, shape or form. And that is absolutely the case. The transition period will end at the end of this year. Now, what 27 countries in the EU do uh, on their side is their business. They, they, uh, they, the EU is there to represent them. As an independent coastal nation, we're here to uh, represent the, 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 the interests of um, businesses and the, and the population in the UK, and we'll make sure um, that we do that. And actually, I think by um, saying uh, now uh, that, uh, that we'll um, have the border, what we'll be doing on the border, in other words, that we'll be um, sensible about the way that we introduce this, uh, makes perfect sense. I sit on the uh, Brexit Operations Committee, which uh, looks at uh, the COBRA Committee that looks at these things all the time and uh, working on you know, what happens with the hauliers and what happens with the transfer of uh, documentation and all the rest of it. And we're absolutely confident that we'll have uh, great systems in place. There's no reason not to. Uh, this country uh, will have all the ability um, to do those things, but we'll do those things on our own terms. Clearly, um, COVID, as you point out, has been a uh, massive disruption uh, to business. We've seen what it's doing um, to the economy. That is why we need the certainty for business of knowing that we are leaving the uh, transition period uh, at the end of the year. And that's what we'll do. And everything else in terms of the borders uh, will uh, fall into place. I'll pass over to Stephen. But just before I do, I'm just going to comment on the medical um, supplies because we, the medicine supplies, we see these stories all the time. It's partly my responsibility for things like the freight contracts to make sure that doesn't happen. We've been challenged probably more than anything else um, since the war in this country with regard to uh, freight supply, good supply, medicine supply. Uh, and it is the case that we have been able to pass that test and never have a shortage of medicines with everything that's been going on in the international demand through COVID. So I'm absolutely confident we'll be able to do the same through the end of the transition period. Stephen. Yes, so uh, thank you very much, Adam. So, of course, uh, medicine supply is very critical for the NHS and for all our patients. And 
colleagues at the Department of Health and Social Care keep a very close eye on all those supply chains, of course with support from the NHS and particularly the chief pharmaceutical officers of the, the four nations and, and their teams. Uh, we did a lot of work on that in preparation for Brexit and indeed COVID has meant that the teams have had to do even more work uh, on uh, medicines and particular medicines that are used in critical care, uh, for instance. So I think we have a very good understanding of those supply chains and, and uh, we're able to look ahead uh, and see where problems might arise and deal with them. Uh, and I should say that uh, Disruption to medicine supply is something that happens all the time uh, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, there may be problems in manufacturing plants around the world, for example, there might be regulatory actions. And as the Secretary of State has said, we are very good uh, at dealing with those, seeing, them, uh, seeing where they happen and putting in uh, place alternative arrangements. So we do know how to do this, but you're absolutely right. It's something that is critical uh, to keep a very close eye on. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thank you, um, Adam. Um, I'll turn now to uh, Gemma Mitchell of Nursing Times. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, the coronavirus pandemic has intensified already existing racial inequalities in nursing. What solid and measurable action is being taken to ensure the NHS and social care system is a safe and supportive place for all our nurses, but particularly those from ethnic minority backgrounds? Um, and secondly, we've heard concerns that student nurses who answered the government's call to join the front line in response to COVID-19 are being asked to carry out duties beyond their level of competence. Is this acceptable and what structures have been put in place to ensure students who have opted in are fully protected and supported? Thank you very much, uh, Gemma. Um, we'll look on the first question about uh, uh, making it safe um, for people to work in uh, what are sometimes by their very nature higher risks uh, areas of uh, public service, sometimes like uh, medicine. We take that incredibly seriously. It's the reason we did uh, that PHE or ask for that PHE report that reported at the beginning of the month. Uh, my uh, colleague, who's the Equalities Minister, uh, Kemi uh, Badenoch, is now uh, in the process of working uh, with that report to come out with a series of recommendations. But I can give you a sort of early sneak preview when I say that um, we consider it doubly important to make sure that people working in um, some of those higher risk environments, which coincidentally are, uh, as you described, environments that black, Asian, minority and ethnic people might be working in, uh, get additional uh, support in terms of testing uh, and uh, 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 tracking and tracing so that we're uh, providing all of the, um, the great NHS track and trace specifically to them. Uh, and in practical terms, that means uh, being able to ramp up the amount of testing uh, that people in that environment uh, are getting, as you rightly point out, um, disproportionately served by people from BAME uh, communities. So that's a very first um, um, thing. And probably on the second point, that's uh, probably one for you, Stephen. Yes, yeah, so you're absolutely right. It's key during COVID-19 that we ensure that the NHS does everything it possibly can to ensure that its nurses, but all, all, all its uh, professionals, all the groups working within the NHS, where they are potentially at higher risk of COVID. And as you know, we have begun to understand the risk factors for that. That includes ethnicity, but it also includes obesity, it includes age, it includes being male, uh, that our individual NHS organisations are able to uh, understand that those individuals need additional support, uh, that we need to risk assess individuals against the work they're doing and where necessarily where necessary redeploy them uh, if that reduces risk of course that's something that can only be done on an individual basis because individual circumstances are different and individual risks are different but we have worked with uh, groups outside the nhs uh, to issue guidance uh, independent expert advice to healthcare organisations as to how they should do that risk assessment and the sorts of things that they may be able uh, to do uh, to support uh, those staff. I think on your second point of, of ensuring that everybody is working within uh, their scope of practice, within their capabilities, of course, that is true across all healthcare professionals. Uh, and it is the case that people should be working uh, in areas in which they are competent and feel competent and local organisations of course uh, with others such as Health Education England are there to make sure that that, that does happen. Stephen thank you very much. Gemma um, thank you for that. And, sorry did you want to come back in? Um, I, I just had 
have one more quick question about student nurses. Um, the new academic year is, is fast approaching and student nurses are still not sure what, the, what their courses, what shape their courses are going to take from September. Um, when are they going to get clarity around that? And is the government making any contingency plans for the possibility that student nurses might have to extend their courses um, because they haven't been able to meet say the clinical hours required due to pandemic and therefore not as many nurses are going to be qualifying um, at the end of the year as we expected. Gemma, thanks. Stephen, do you know Well, I think one of the things that is generally true as a result of COVID, and I think this is education, higher education in general, which would include nurses but other professional groups, is that universities, institutes that do that teaching are having to rethink the way they do, they deliver teaching. And you're seeing that in universities in general, and I think you will see that in individual courses. And I know Health Education England, who have responsibilities in this area, working very closely with the providers who provide training to student nurses to think how we can most effectively deliver that training in a COVID environment where it will be less possible to do the sort of face-to-face -face teaching in some part of the courses that we've traditionally done. Now, as it happens, I think many universities, many institutions have been moving in that direction over time and thinking about different ways of teaching. And, and it, as with many things, COVID-19 will accelerate that process. But what's important throughout all of this is that that high quality education uh, is in place and it, it, and it appropriately prepares people for the workplace. Gemma, thank you. Stephen, thank you to you. And I want to say thank you to Sir Peter. Uh, as well. Um, uh, and just to finish off by um, saying, when I stood here at other times in earlier press conferences, we've been reporting deaths in the many hundreds and infections in the many, many thousands. And we are reaching a point now where those numbers have come down. But it's absolutely essential that we don't throw this away. Uh, it's going to be another warm weekend. Uh, it's very, very important that people continue to uh, follow uh, this advice. We do not want to be going backwards or facing a second spike. And of course, critically, from Monday, if you're travelling on public transport, which once again we ask you to avoid, but please remember face coverings are mandatory in England from Monday. Thank you very much. So that's the end of the latest coronavirus uh, press briefing at Downing Street Grant Chaps there, the Transport Secretary. Let's uh, just remind you of the main points that came out of that briefing then uh, with Mr Shapps. And from Monday, as he said, it will be compulsory to wear face coverings on all public transport in England. Failure to do so may result in a fine or you being refused to travel. Uh, the Transport Secretary reminded us that if you can work from home, you should. But if you can't work from home, you should try to avoid public transport. Uh, Mr Shapps also said the latest UK figures on the pandemic are encouraging and that despite the increase in testing, new positive coronavirus cases do continue to fall. The R number remains stable at between 0.7 and 0.9. And once again, the Transport Secretary told people that they should avoid mass gatherings of more than six people. Uh, it comes as the latest figures show another 202 people have died after testing positive for COVID-19 in the UK. Uh, the latest death toll now stands at 41,000. 481. Let's go to our political... See the headlines as they happen and watch BBC News live in the app and get the full story with bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Follow the story for all the latest with BBC News.